Uh, Mr. Secretary, thanks for being here. This is a big deal, $1.2 trillion in spending. Obviously, a big chunk of that was existing programs, but another big chunk of that, of course, are new programs. Your job, of course, is to help facilitate some of the spending of this money here. When can we expect to see some of that money get into the hands of the state transportation agencies and get into the hands of some of the private sector participants? Well, a lot of it can move very quickly because it's designed to move through uh, a lot of uh, programs and, and plumbing, so to speak, that we already have, uh, formula funds, for example, that go out almost automatically to the states, as well as grant programs that uh, are more discretionary on the part of my office, but uh, that we already know how to do and uh, wish we had more dollars to work with because we get so many more great applications than we can actually fund. That changes with the expansion. Having said that, I, I want to point out this is very different from 2009. This is not about just pumping that money into the economy as swiftly as we possibly can and finding all the shovel-ready projects. We're really focused on shovel-worthy projects because the goal here, while of course there is a benefit in terms of jobs and, uh, and demand, the, the, the real goal here is to shore up and strengthen the foundations of American competitiveness for the rest of it, uh, this half century. And, and that means uh, standing up whole new programs that, that uh, don't exist today. I'll give you two examples. Mm. One is a Safe Streets for All program. Uh, that's going to enhance safety because because we have far too many fatalities in our country on our roadways. The second is the PROTECT uh, program. This is about resilience because we know that our infrastructure is increasingly vulnerable to extreme weather. Uh, we're going to fund improvements to harden it for the reality that the next 30 years are going to be a little different from the last 50. Secretary, talking of vulnerability in the infrastructure, we are currently talking day in, day out about the supply chain woes that currently face the United States. And of course, this is for a longer term gain that we see this spending. But in the short term, there's going to be pinch points. There's going to be perhaps further traffic, the paradox therein. How can you ensure that we don't worsen the situation through this investment? Well, that's why we have to work both tracks at the same time. Obviously, those long-term investments in our ports, our airports, our, our rail systems are going to benefit the long-term strength of our supply chain. But uh, as you said, we have a short-term uh, set of concerns as well. And we've got to make sure that uh, actions we're taking right now help to ease that. Now, that's exactly what the president's port action plan does. Uh, we're uh, getting ready within 45 days to put out some new rounds of funding for ports. Uh, we've got actions right now like sweeper ships going around picking up empties, uh, proposed fines or fees for shippers that are leaving their containers in the way. Uh, my department partnering with states to get commercial driver's license issued uh, quickly and without as much red tape uh, so that we can alleviate those short-term issues even while laying the right foundation for the long run. And it might go without saying, but I shouldn't let it go without saying, the biggest thing we can do about these disruptions that we're experiencing in this moment, since they're largely caused by the pandemic, is to confront the pandemic itself. Okay. You know, on that note, it's been interesting. The administration has said that this will not increase inflation as well. How does an extra trillion dollars in spending not increase inflation? by increasing the productive capacity of this country. And uh, that's a very important thing that we, frankly, have not successfully done across most of my lifetime. You know, I've been waiting for this legislation for months since I became Transportation Secretary, but various presidents have been hoping to reach this day for decades. And it hasn't happened for all kinds of reasons. The American public has been rightly impatient. Now we're getting it done, both making up for lost time and laying a better foundation for the future. Let me also point out to the fact that part two of the president agenda, what I like to call uh, the big deal. But part two of that, the, the Build Back Better Act, has even more that will help beat back inflation by lowering some of the costs that Americans feel most acutely, the cost of child care, the cost of health care, the cost of housing, the cost of prescription drugs, bringing those down while also making sure that we ease some of those labor market issues we have yeah. by making yeah. it easier for working parents to afford to go back to work. All right. Well, let's still uh, stick on part one here and to our uh, TV, radio, and YouTube audiences. We're speaking here with U.S. Transportation. Secretary Pete Buttigieg. Uh, Mr. Secretary here, within uh, the components of this bill, the one that the president is supposed to sign, there are a lot of provisions for a lot of this money to flow to union uh, run companies, a lot of this money to flow to sort of address, uh, I guess, inequalities. You talk about the Justice 40 initiatives, a lot of money that effectively has to clear a lot of hurdles before it can actually be spent here. When you talk about the speed and the pace even if it's long term of getting these projects going, how much are those programs going to potentially be an impediment? 
Well, I think that reflects the, the long-term nature of the vision here. But let's be clear. I mean, this blue-collar vision is going to speak to the needs of uh, Americans right now. Uh, we want to be putting more uh, electricians to work, more plumbers and pipe fitters, more uh, people who uh, would be in the construction industry. And, yeah, we have a lot of people, especially when you talk about some of those equity issues, uh, where you've got uh, people who are perfectly willing and capable of doing that work who haven't always been included. Uh, having the, the full capacity of this country, uh, including, for example, communities of color and women who've been underrepresented in a lot of the workforce that's related to transportation. You know, getting them online, that's not going to slow this down. That's going to increase our ability to deliver, which is exactly what we need to be doing. Uh, again, this is very different from the 2009 scenario where we were just trying to push money out the door to deal with a collapse in demand. This is about making sure we're doing the right thing for the near term and for the long term. It's interesting that, of course, you mentioned equity there, and racial equity has been something that you've sort of talked about within highway design in particular. You've come under some criticism, I think, of Ted Cruz in particular, about your emphasis of fixing issues resulting from perhaps, well, racist decision making, whether it be no realized at the time or not. Have you, what, how, what do you make of that criticism? I don't know. Uh, you know, maybe some people are struggling to explain why they voted against roads and bridges, and so they're they're looking for a, another angle. But uh, I'm proud to stand up and, and say that we're going to confront some of these inequities uh, that were created in the past. It doesn't hurt anybody to tell the truth about how some of our roads were built, and uh, it's going to help everybody, help entire communities to try to put that right. And so, you know, we're, we're going to continue to tell the truth about the, this fact, not not to make anybody feel guilty, uh, but to explain how we're going to be intentional and much much better about this in the, in the future than America has sometimes been in the past. Another perhaps small criticism has also been municipal bonds not included in this infrastructure bill. You're a former mayor. You know the way mayors and local governments are traditionally uh, the tried and true way in this country of building infrastructure. You're working with the former mayor of New Orleans as well. So you guys deeply know how infrastructure is usually built in this country. Why not go that tried and true way? Well, look, uh, we are partnering with cities, states, tribes, territories to deliver. I just uh, literally on my way to standing here ran into uh, two good friends, a prominent Democratic mayor and a prominent Republican mayor, who are overjoyed about this. I only wish, when I was mayor, uh, that we had an infusion of resources and support coming my way back when I was in South Bend uh, that we do right now. And we are so eager and so excited to work with the mayors who were advocating so strongly for this bill in the first place and be at their side and delivering for their residents and constituents. I want to go back to some of the supply chain issues, uh, Mr. Secretary. We could talk about uh, onshoring a lot of manufacturing. We can talk about cleaning up the ports here. Um, we could talk about a lot of the other infrastructure measures in this bill. What does this bill do at all to address some of the freight transportation issues, which so many people that we've spoken to, the ports of Long Beach, Alabama, here in New Jersey, New York, the idea here that so much of what we're dealing with right now which are long-term issues that preceded the COVID crisis are directly tied to a breakdown in freight transportation. Yeah, it's a great point. You know, sometimes the freight side doesn't get as much attention as the passenger side. And uh, a vulnerability a thousand miles inland could actually be one of the reasons why you see ships at anchor uh, off the coast of, uh, let's say, California. And so we really need to make sure that we're investing in, in these multimodal facilities where you have that exchange between rail cars and trucks, for example, getting those containers to flow more efficiently. Uh, and of course, that's not just a matter of physical infrastructure. A lot of labor issues, too, especially on the trucking side. Uh, but let's be clear. The honest truth is that this country is not making the best use of the truckers that we already have. Uh, I hear so many stories from truckers about their experience going up to a port and uh, getting conflicting instructions about where to go and, and make a pickup. And since they get paid by the load, not by the hour, uh, they're really digesting the cost of that wasted time. But it's a cost to the economy at large. So we got a lot of issues to work through on the freight side, not just at and in the ports, although I'm proud of our port investments that we're going to be doing. Uh, but really uh, uh, throughout the entire system, and that includes both the trucking and the rail side of things.